welcome to Revolutionary Health Live, the show that focuses on Black gay men's health and wellness. So excited to have you here. I'm your host, Michael Ward, back again with a very important topic. And I'm so very excited as well today. But before we get into that, make sure that you follow us on all our social media, uh, facebook.com forward slash CMP Tribe, Instagram and Twitter as well. We are at CNP Tribe. In today's topic, we are bringing back our physicians roundtable to give us updates on COVID-19, how far we come, where we are right now, and what we can look forward to in the future. So I'm so very excited to have these three special guests back here with us. We've got Dr. David Mel Branch there with the arms out ready for some time. We got Dr. Leo. What's up? Peace and Last but not least, we've got Dr. Robinson. So just want to let everybody know really quickly while we're here, make sure that you remember that we are live. Ask as many questions as you want to while we have doctors here. Anything that you want to know, please use this time to ask them because this is an experience with you all. So gentlemen, how are you all doing? Just quick update and let the people know where you're from as well. We can start with you, Dr. David Melbrench with the arms. Sorry, I didn't. I, as long as I've been doing this for a year, it's like it still happens. Um, so I didn't uh, unmute myself. So yeah, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, um, internal medicine doc, sexual health, HIV specialist. Uh, doing good overall, um, peaceful, uh, enjoying the weather in Atlanta. Um, and in the middle, I was telling y'all before we gave live, I'm in the middle of this Arden Gardens fast or detoxification oration thing where you drink two gallons of like grapefruit juice and orange juice and distilled water. And so I'm craving something that's edible like food and I can't wait to eat tomorrow morning. That's all I'm gonna say. Summer is coming, huh? You're getting ready for the summer? Getting ready for the summer. Trying to keep up with Dr. Leo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Dr. Leo Moore. I am an internal medicine physician. I'm based in Los Angeles. It's great to be back with my brothers. I'm excited for this conversation. Hope everyone's well. And I'm Dr. Quentin Robinson. I'm in Atlanta as well. I'm glad to be back, doing well. You know, it's interesting enough, I was when I was reposting this, I was like, it's been a year since we've done this. So it's gonna be a lot to talk about in an hour. <laughs> I know. I'm so very excited. And I was actually thinking about that, too, as uh, Dr. Leo calls y'all the dream team of everything that we were talking about last year with COVID-19 when I was sitting in this exact same spot here. And I was just like, oh, my God, the world is looking a little bit different um, from where we are right now. We see very, very many people are getting vaccinated. I can't say a lot of people are excited about getting vaccinated, but I think that's the largest development, shall we say, in COVID-19 since we spoke last year um, here. And I'm just curious to know as well. I'm fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I know I'm one of the people who was like, I'm not going to give my body to science. I'm not going to donate and experiments. And I sat on here and I and I transparency, I was like, not running out to get the vaccine. But I would just say in the year since we have uh, last spoken, what are your thoughts about the vaccine coming so quickly? I know, uh, Dr. Mel Branch, we spoke about this the last time you were on the show. Um, but just as far as the vaccine rollout and it coming out so quickly, what have you all seen, experienced? Um, if you are vaccinated and care to share, it's all up to you to share your personal information. Um, but how are you all feeling about that a year later since we last spoke? So I will kick it off with you, Dr. Uh, Leo, as well, since you are a part of the dream team. Awesome. Awesome. So you're right. A lot has happened in a year. And um, I agree it was a swift rollout with the vaccines, but certainly uh, one that uh, was necessary. Um, I got vaccinated probably about uh, two weeks after the uh, Pfizer vaccine uh, was approved. Um, and I didn't have any side effects from being vaccinated or anything. Um, I, uh, well, let me go back on that. I felt a little tired on uh, day uh, two after uh, that second dose, but otherwise it was great. Um, and 
I think one of the things that I'm happy about with us getting to this point where vaccines are available and people are at least, you know, able um, to get them is that I'm able to reconnect with people, at least in person, you know, and that's something that I definitely will say that I miss and something that I'll disclose being um, a single man, you know, being uh, kind of having to shelter in place in your own space alone, which I think is something that uh, a lot of other folks can identify with, that at least, you know, this is given um, a, a way for uh, people to be able to get together safely and and that should only be able to increase with time. Thank you. I'll kick it off as well with Dr. Robinson. I see you smiling. <laughs> so yeah, I um, was super excited about the vaccine from the very beginning. I, you know, I usually call myself the resident nerd. So I got super excited just about the, the method and the, the technique in, in terms of how the vaccine was made and how it's completely different from any of the, at least two of the vaccines are completely different from any of the vaccines we, we've ever used. Um, I'm also fully vaccinated. I completed mine back in January. Um, I actually got the Moderna vaccine. And similar to, to Leo, that second day kind of wiped me out a little bit. I think for me more so it was combined with, you know, getting up at five o'clock in the morning. But um, yeah, that next day I was kind of wiped out a little bit. The arm pain, you know, I think if they were to ever list like the number one complaint in any package insert, that arm pain is no joke. It it hurts and it, it lasts for a while. But yeah, like Lee, I'm excited. You know, it's an opportunity to kind of, you know, have people at least reconnect on, on, on a smaller level right now. And I think with the, the update, you know, not to jump too far ahead in the CDC guidance for people who've been vaccinated, kind of gives people this little you know, this little ray of sunshine in terms of we, we we're definitely you know turning the curve a little bit yeah and I, th I think for me i got the pfizer one um and i hadn't started working i started uh doing some part-time clinical work at aids healthcare foundation one of the local clinics here in atlanta and before that i wasn't thinking about getting vaccinated i just wanted to wait and let you know people who may have been uh categorized at higher risk and then when I got the job, I was like, OK, let me go ahead and get vaccinated. So I got the Pfizer vaccine and I, I tolerated it pretty well. And I'm pretty proactive when it comes to vaccines. Like I'll take a leave or I'll take some ibuprofen after the vaccine to kind of make sure I have some anti-inflammatories on board in my body before, you know, the stuff kicks in. And I will say this, uh, being a man of a certain age, older than all y'all in this room, I got the shingles vaccine back in July and in November of last year. That shingles vaccine, you want to talk about arm pain? That was no joke. And so for me, COVID-19 didn't hold a candle to the shingles vaccine because the shingles afterwards, I was like, yeah, but COVID-19, I took my leave. I took a little bit of ibuprofen uh, like six or eight hours later, and I was actually pretty good. Great. Thank y'all for sharing that because I have been telling people about my experience and just telling them too, the the most that I probably had was the arm pain um, and probably like the anxiety of going. Um, I had mine at the Delta Museum. I think it's Delta Museum down in Hapeville uh, here for those people that live in Atlanta and literally driving, sitting in my car, driving, seeing the military uh uniforms and the people coming i'm like oh my god this is literally like a movie I'm, I'm in a movie right now in this time and so getting over that and then finally um getting the shot and being vaccinated the arm pain was it i'll, I'll take that uh versus having COVID 19 um which is nothing to play with as well tell you about that experience later kids um but i wanted to <laughs> i want to touch on something that dr leo said as far as now being vaccinated and feeling a little bit safer about going out um, as a single man, as a person, you know, that has been self-isolating or quarantined for a little period of time, that's missing family, missing loved ones, that's wanting mm -hmm. to travel, that's wanting to get out. Um, what are you all excited about? You've already answered, Dr. Weir, but what are you all excited about now that you are vaccinated of being able to go outside? And to, to add a follow-up question to that, and add a little irony here and sarcasm, do we still need to wear our mask when we go outside? Um, as far as Dr. Robinson said with the CDC guidance that we'll touch on. 
<laughs> you you want to take that? All right. So for me, I, for me, it's live concerts. That's what I'm looking forward to. <clears throat> live music, whether it's smaller crowds indoors, whether we're outside at Chastain, that's what I'm looking for. It's just a, a good live concert. Now there aren't any lined up anytime soon, but I think when one comes around, at this point, I don't care who it is, I'll go and see them <laughs> in concert. Um, as far as wearing your mask outside, you know, there are the, 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 the conditions as I call them. So ideally, if you're fully vaccinated, if you're outside in an open space and there are not that many people around, you can forego your mask. But if you're outside with a large group of people who are also outside, you should wear your mask. That's kind of the biggest thing that I would kind of say to take away from that, that guidance. You know, if you're fully vaccinated outside by yourself or a small group of people that you know who are also vaccinated, no mask. Mm -hmm. If there's a large group of people who are in tight spaces, you should wear your mask. And if you are inside, you should wear your mask even though you're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can't even stress enough how, I don't know, you know, cause I'm a nerd too. I know Q's probably the biggest nerd out of the four of us, but we all nerds on a certain, we all nerds on a certain level, right? So mm -hmm. I kind of geeked out when I saw the new CDC recommendations too. And what I loved about it was the pictures and the illustrations with the faces and the mask. And they said, if you're vaccinated this, if you're not this, and they give columns. And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, go to, do yourself a favor and go to the CDC website, cdc.gov and check them out because they really break it down. And so I think when a lot of us are craving knowledge and people are saying, well, they don't explain it to us. So they don't tell us what to do, or they're not giving us guidance. It's right in front of us. So go to the CDC's website and read it. It's really in plain terms. It's in easy to read illustrations. And that's, that's what I absolutely loved about it. And it kind of gives every condition. Of course, it's not going to get every condition or every situation, but it covers the most of them in a really comprehensive way. So for me, even though I'm vaccinated, I've been traveling and going on planes probably since I think the first trip was last November. I went on a trip to Vegas and I, I wore my mask the whole time. The casinos out there had everybody masked up. Um, I'm looking forward to taking a road trip to Savannah uh, in about a week. And then I'm, I'm going to St. Martin uh, for Memorial Day weekend and I'm going to be wearing my mask there. So I'm kind of one of those people I'd already um, anticipated or prepared myself that I would be wearing a mask in, like Quentin was saying, in, in closed situations, probably until 2022, maybe even mid 2022. When I go outside, if I go for a walk or I'm doing something, there's nobody around me, I'm not wearing my mask. Um, and that was actually before I was vaccinated. I didn't feel it was going to be that high of a risk to be outside with the fresh air and things moving around. Um, so I, I did it that way, but it was good to see that the CDC guidance uh, kind of updated that. Yeah, I completely agree. The CDC guidance, the way it's laid out, it's very clear. Um, and so I agree with like sharing that, reviewing that. Um, I'll say I'm also really excited about travel. Um, and another thing I'm excited about being a family man is that my, um, my grandmother has been vaccinated and her, my sister, my mom and my nephew are coming for my mom's birthday in September. So That's I'll great. get to, you know, like have all the family over at my place and being able to just, again, connect with people. And as an introvert, to be a person that's talking about connecting with people for, you know, you guys know me. So for me to be excited about connecting, that means it's been a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I definitely understand and agree. I am flying home to Houston, Texas, to actually celebrate my papa, as we call it, his 80th birthday. And it's the first time that I've seen uh, my grandparents in maybe almost two plus years. And just getting to see all my family in Houston, Texas, and having some boudin and good gumbo, and just getting mm -hmm. to be a country boy is Can I go? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely looking forward to that. I want to bring in a question that we have. Uh, from Matthew Carroll, uh, do the doctors have tips for the day before and after the vaccine? What to do, not to do? I've heard no alcohol or Advil. Whoever wants to take it. 
Well, I'll start since I was talking about Advent just a second ago. <laughs> it's interesting. And I, I, I want to hear what Leo and Quentin have heard mm -hmm. about this. And also, mm -hmm. Michael, what you've heard um, with people talking about. Because I remember when they first talked about COVID um, and people getting sick with the virus, they were telling people to just use Tylenol and not use ibuprofen or Aleve. And I remember combing the literature to see why people were saying not to use it. And I couldn't find anything substantial that would say it would be harmful. So for me, you know, with any vaccine, I tend to use anti-inflammatories over Tylenol. So I will use an Advil or an Aleve because it reduces inflammation, whereas Tylenol just reduces your fever. So I think Tylenol, for me at least, is relatively useless in that respect. But some people find a benefit from it, particularly if your immune system is being stimulated. Um, you can get a fever. So a Tylenol can keep the fever down but I haven't heard anything about people saying not to use Advil or ibuprofen or leave, um, at least not that I've read. I don't know what you guys have heard. I mean, I saw some something just kind of briefly. I will say I didn't dive deep into it in terms of, you know, not taking anything. But, you know, there was this concern of it potentially modifying your immune response. And, then, and for me, I was like, it's not that big a deal unless you're taking like mega doses frequently. I think the amount of arm pain or discomfort that you get is so brief that, you know, it may not be necessary. Like, I don't think, I don't recall that taking anything for, for my pain that I had with it as well. And I think, you know, to the question of alcohol, I, I was kind of, it's kind of one of those, it's really, I shrugged my shoulders. It's like, I wouldn't do anything different. I mean, you shouldn't, you know, if you, have an, uh, an over abundance of alcohol, it's probably not a good idea just to show for someone to jab a needle in your arm and you're hung over because you're just going to continue to feel worse. But I don't think there's anything specific that would modify how you would, how the vaccine would protect you. And, you know, especially when the, when people were starting to talk about it, I kind of, you know, I'm a huge fan of language matters and words matter. I changed how I described what happens. So when it, giving the vaccine to patients, I was like, so when you get this vaccine, you're going to have some pain, you may have a fever, and you may have some fatigue. That is an expected immune response. So if you change the way that people think about it, because you hear side effects, you think, oh, God, this is something bad. Mm -hmm. If you get a fever, or if you feel a little tired or your arm hurts, we want that to happen. <laughs> and that's kind of mm -hmm. just I was proactively changing the language I was using just to kind of alleviate some of that concern and anxiety that people had around it. I agree with that. What I've been uh, telling uh, my patients and family and friends who asked is, if you're gonna take an anti-inflammatory, take it after you've been vaccinated. The other thing that I've been mentioning is just hydrate, 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 you know, ahead of getting vaccinated and uh, to also ensure that you've eaten because we get a lot of folks who, you know, haven't eaten, uh, haven't, you know, had water or anything in the morning. And we have had some people pass out, you know. Um, and so the other thing, is particularly for those who um, tend to pass out when they get vaccines or when they get blood drawn, things of that nature, is just trying to make sure that they've at least kind of uh, hydrated enough to kind of get through that without uh, having a, a bad experience. So that would be the only thing that, that I would add to what to what the dream team shared. Yeah, and I think that would actually, um, that goes along with what Quentin was saying about moderation, um, particularly with alcohol. What Leo just said about hydrating, if you drink alcohol, that's gonna dehydrate you. Um, and so you have to make sure that you're kind of in the best position possible. So probably it, you could have a drink, um, a glass of wine, something like that small. But if you're going out and thinking you're gonna have like four or five Long Island iced teas, that's probably not a good idea. So again, it's kind of, there's this whole communication of absolutes versus what can be done with moderation. And I just wanna say with, with Quentin's point um, about how we're using language, I was literally on a, uh, a live webinar panel um, a second ago talking about the ballroom communities um, and COVID-19. And one of the things that came up over and over again in the session we just had was the poor communication and then also how the ballroom community really felt left out and hadn't had any specific initiatives targeting them. But a lot of the folks that were on our panel 
said, if this had just been communicated better, if they had just explained it in more down to earth terms, because they still had the same concerns with why did the vaccine come out so quick? Um, how did y'all get this done so fast? I don't want to be experimented on. Why do you need so many different types of vaccines? Like those questions were still lingering. So to Quentin's point, um, communication and language has really been the Achilles heel of this COVID-19 vaccine rollout, but it started not to get political, but it started with the previous administration. I can't help myself, but it's, it started with the previous administration and kind of the lack of communication, the, you know, the disjointed messaging, and then not even having a plan or a rollout for the vaccines. And then you pass it on to your predecessor and expect them to just pick up the baton. So I think given all those circumstances, what the current administration has done has actually been nothing short of phenomenal. Not to mention that, you know, it was project, uh, warp speed or operation warp speed some the language that you know was used was was also um you know stigmatizing and and could definitely uh create fear right and so i think we've all been kind of trying to clean up the mess of that administration and you know a, a big part of that has been like for us on the ground having conversations with folks i, I know that um, there was also an issue um, uh, in LA as well about just wanting to make sure that we are really like reaching out to uh, the house and ball community. And we're working very closely with the community to uh, develop events and really get out there and vaccinate as many uh, folks as possible. But I agree, it takes those conversations. It takes thinking about those groups and it takes having those people at the table to craft the right messages as well, which I think was something that has been missing um, and is one of the reasons that we're starting to see a, a downturn uh, in our vaccine turnout, honestly, is that the communities that need to be at the table, we've gotten past the people who are excited about being vaccinated. Now we're at the place where we really need to have a groundswell, meaning we need to be on the ground having the people who, you know, are in the community talking to community members about why this is so important, helping to get people further along, you know, the stages of change. I love that, definitely. And that ties into our next question. We have a lot of questions tonight. I love it, y'all. So don't um, stop, keep dropping the questions, but how do you all feel that COVID-19 has changed how you interact with patients from a year ago? Hmm. Oh, well, for those <laughs> <laughs> we all had to think about it for a second. We were like, what? <laughs> Go ahead, Leo. I guess I'll say the thing that I hate about COVID-19, and I'm sure we all have many things we hate about it, is that, you know, we have to wear the mask, right? And that the patient is wearing the mask. And, you know, I'm a very expressive person, like with my face, you know, and so there's only so much I can do with these eyes. I do a lot with them. There's only so much that I can do with them to, you know, fully connect with the person. So that's one of the things, you know, I'm I'm um, looking forward to getting to a point at some point, as David said, in maybe 2022, 2023, you know, to get to a point where we're not wearing that mask so that we can like at least kind of see each other uh, more, more clearly. I, I am uh, happy that at least at this point, uh, a lot of our clinics and our services are kind of uh, at least reopening because I work for the health department. You know, of course, we have to like shift folks to work on an outbreak. And so with COVID-19, um, there was a lot of shifting that happened, but we're finally kind of getting back to a point to where our services are ramping back up. Um, so um the thing I'm most excited about, at least although there are barriers and challenges, is that patients are actually able to access as many services as possible with us, in addition to COVID testing and vaccination. I'm sorry about that. I um, <laughs> I think my Wi-Fi went out for a second. I was going to say, um, I was excited. You know what I've been doing a lot with patients? And I, I don't mind the mask. You can kind of still th see the expressions behind people's faces. Um, but I, I kind of, instead of shaking hands, I'm doing a lot of elbow bumps and stuff like that. And I think people seem to appreciate that because I've watched other providers and I've watched other people and they don't seem to touch, shake hands, put a hand on the shoulder, those kind of things. And I'm not really afraid of that. So for me, I'm putting an elbow out. Um, I'm doing a full physical exam like I was before. 
Um, but I miss kind of being able to see a whole, you know, the whole patient's face. But I, I do think it, while it's challenging, there are ways that we can connect with patients because everyone's feeling isolated. Everyone is feeling somewhat detached from people and the masks automatically put up a physical barrier. But there are things you can do with your persona, with your tone, with your attention, with your eye contact that really will uh, will help improve patient care. Because as I, I think I heard Leo saying um and I'm sure we've been talking about while I was out for a second, but you know, a lot of the services that we provide to our patients have been compromised because of this. So I think it requires even more from us as the providers um, to incorporate a physical touch and a, a you know just kind of a personal touch as well. Mm -hmm. Kind of lets people know that they're not alone, or you know, this isn't you know they're not some pariahs that we're trying to avoid. And I'll say. Where I think Leo and David did mention it was, you know, virtual visits and telehealth. As much as an introvert as I am, I didn't realize how much I missed that interaction with my patients in the, in, you know, being in an exam room and having a conversation, whether I'm seeing their face via mask. But I, I will say, at least for where I am, we really didn't do a lot of, um, we didn't have a lot of concerns when it came to transitioning. I think we, you know, right, especially with George's cases, we kind of went immediate into a, a, a pretty rapid change into doing virtual visits, but we still had the ability and the, the staff to do some in-person visits. And now a year out, we've kind of gradually, you know, moved to bring more people into the office. Like for example, this week was supposed to be my, my virtual visit week. And I literally had three patients scheduled for today. And it was kind of what I've noticed when I'm looking at the weeks that I'm scheduled to be on, you know, our telehealth, that I have close to no patients scheduled, meaning that even patients are feeling, you know, much more comfortable coming back into the practice. Our office is offering the vaccine. So it was another opportunity for people who couldn't get to any of the large vaccine sites. So I think it's an opportunity now we've seen this huge transition from not seeing patients to having these video calls, doing a hybrid model, and we're kind of slowly moving back to where we were pre-pandemic. I think a handful of patients are gonna love the virtual visits because you know they're like, okay, I'm on my lunch break, or I'm taking a break and I'm in the hallway and not have to actually lose time for work, even though I think as Americans, we, we put too much emphasis on work and we all work too much, mm -hmm. but that's a whole mm -hmm. other conversation not related mm -hmm. to, to COVID, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, it allowed people to kind of, you know, modify their schedule and their lifestyle to actually be more engaged in healthcare than they would have been before. Yes. Thank well, you. I definitely think that, I just was going to say very quickly, I think you raise a, a really important point about primary care and the care of a provider and patient provider relationship, especially around the vaccine, um, because, you know, we're getting to the point where these mega pods or these large sites, um, you know, where we've been doing drive through for vaccination or walk up even for mask sites, we're, we're getting to a point to where because the turnout is so low in those sites, we're going to have to transition people back to uh, getting uh, vaccines, you know, in primary care and in offices, right? So um, so I think that relationship uh, is so important, you know, and, and that that may be one of the major things that will drive us to get to a point to where more folks uh, get comfortable and get vaccinated. Yeah, thank you for that. And that was gonna be one of the things I can say as a patient, <clears throat> excuse me, is I had my first in-person uh, visit with uh, my new primary care, don't tell my old primary care have the conversation later but i made a joke to one of my friends that i was like oh my god like he touched me and i had to get an sti check and all of that so i was like oh my god like he touched me i just don't know how i felt about it i felt a little way about it you know what i'm talking about and i was like not having that experience probably within the last year of just doing virtual visits and coming in for um getting my labs drawn and it was just like so impersonal that it felt like a little bit of a family reunion at the same time of getting to learn a new pcp in the office and i'm like Oh my God, you touched me, you you know? Cause we were doing the fist bump and the, hey bro stuff, how you doing? I'm like, to be able to come in and give the hug and like, okay, you all right. Um, but I also want to touch upon the piece because um, about what you were saying about getting vaccinated in the office, because uh, one of the things um, too, that we had a discussion with my PCP about was getting vaccinated. Um, 
for HPV and other other things like that going through my sexual history. And I was explaining to him, this was prior to me getting vaccinated with COVID-19, is that it would just be so much easier if I come in here, y'all stick me, I'm good, and I can go home. And I think when it comes to access, a lot of what I hear from people is that they don't want to have the drive through experience or they don't um, necessarily want to go get masks and stand in the line and go down um, here in Georgia to uh, the stadium. It feels like kind of kind of weird. My experience was very much, like I said, a movie military. But when it comes to access, especially within black and brown communities, um, what are we seeing in terms of more access um, location wise and more people willing to get vaccinated? Um, because a lot of it to me is just like you say, having the conversations and using that language. But in terms of that and in terms of uh, rates as well of uh, black and brown people contracting uh, COVID-19, what are we seeing now? I know I ask a lot of questions all at once, y'all. <laughs> I think with that, personally, at least in Georgia, and then even still some somewhere in Metro Atlanta, I still think we have some work to do. I still don't think we've done enough. You know, you look at the numbers and like vaccine rates look good. The governor is talking about closing some of the mass vaccination sites by the end of May. And then I'm looking at numbers and I'm a little concerned that we're probably, you know, jumping the gun a little bit. Um, I can't, you know, quote any numbers off the top of my head, but I just think for me, I think we still have some work to do. I think we need to go deeper into communities. You know, I love the idea, like, you know, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium and, you know, Fulton County has been doing an amazing job at getting people vaccinated. But I think it's time now to look at resources and where, you know what? Let's take this mobile van out to Adamsville in, you know, Southwest Atlanta, set up in a family dollar parking lot and just kind of actually have access. I think, you know, certain communities are still, you know, they're probably small pockets, but, you know, that's where, it, you know, it can start. You know, you'll see this resurgence in these small pockets of people in, in you know, I will say, underserved communities who also have these jobs that are putting them in front of people. So I think if we, you know, don't really start pushing the vaccine, you know, out from the center of the city, that we're going to start seeing little, you know, I don't want to call them mini outbreaks, but we're going to start seeing another, you know, small increase in these small pockets of um, infection. So I, I still think we have some work to do. Yeah, I would agree. I think, I think one of the things that it's forced me to do as a clinician, um, and depends on the clinic where you work at. Sometimes they have medical assistants that review a patient's uh, vaccination. Sometimes it's on the, the clinician, whoever it is. It's forced me to have these conversations about vaccines more often. And I'm, I find myself actually, because I'm working at an HIV clinic, that's about 80% um, covers uninsured and probably about 80 to 90% black. And I'm having these conversations and I find myself asking the general question, what do you think about vaccines? up front in general. And a lot of times they beeline right, folks will beeline right to COVID-19. And they're like, you know, I don't trust it. And I was like, well, what about the flu or this, that, and the other? They're like, oh, I'll get the flu or I'll get these other ones. What other ones do you think I need, doc? And then we talk about HPV, we talk about Lumavax, we talk about tetanus and all that other stuff. There's something very specific about this COVID-19 vaccine and how quickly it came out, the political context in which things happened that has people really kind of a little bit hesitant. And the most common response that I've seen is people saying, you know, I'm gonna wait and see. Like that's literally, I'm gonna wait and see because I don't, I don't trust that there were enough people that were in the clinical trial. So I think it's on us in addition to, you know, what Leo and Quentin were saying about, you know, bringing this back into the, um, into the clinical spaces or taking mobile units being out. I think also the messaging has to change as we move along. And so those of us that are um, active on social media need to be the ones who are out there doing that because I've heard people still spouting different kind of myths about the vaccines that I've been like, oh my God, are people still saying that? Like I thought we had done enough of a job, but it just, to me, it reinforces the fact that we have to be out there and much more vocal on Twitter, on YouTube, on you know Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever modem it may be, we have to be vocal out there because a lot of people that I'm hearing after I did an Instagram video or after I posted something on Twitter, they were like, Doc, I heard what you had to say 
and I, I made the decision to get the vaccine. And that warms my heart when, it, when it's one person that says that, but it lets me know that we're not actually uh, speaking as loudly as some of these other voices that are spreading conspiracy theories. So we have a lot to do on the um, on the messaging front and the public health front to actually get the word out while we're you know shifting into these other delivery systems. I agree completely with with David and Quentin. We have to take it to the street, and that's been a lot of my work for the last few months. And what's interesting is. There's already a great network of uh, organizations that um, that serve, for example, people living with HIV. We've been tapping a lot into the community based organizations that are already connected to community, partnering with them to do mobile vaccine events. I mean, at this point, uh, my team has been calling nearby uh, hotels, restaurants to uh, vaccinate their employees and then to also have events uh, at the restaurants or at malls or in shopping plazas. Um, workers unions, es essentially any group that we can identify, you know, that is in hard hit communities, we are partnering with those groups to go out and vaccinate. Um, because, you know, as much as even when I mentioned earlier about primary care, we know that everyone doesn't have access to primary care. So we have to make sure that we are providing opportunities and then also making sure that uh, those who may be undocumented know that we're not going to turn their information over to ICE. You know, so a lot of conversations about, you know, this information will not be shared. Uh, no, you don't have to have a government ID. You can just have some type of ID that shows us who you are. Um, you know, so that way we can we can get you vaccinated. And so uh, I think uh, a big part of this that's going to change the landscape is how much we can take it to the street, how much we can have conversations with people in the field, how much we can bring the vaccine to them and education to them that they can learn and then take back to their community and talk to other folks about it. Yes, thank you. I love these questions, y'all. Keep them coming as well. Um, and this one is a high topic. I love this question already. And I'm so interested in what you guys are going to say. Um, but how has COVID-19 research impacted ongoing HIV research? Dr. Mel French. <laughs> why, why is it coming to me first? Um, you know, I, and I, you look like you were deep in thought. So I'm like, come on. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's it's offered some funding streams. And so it's it's challenged a lot of researchers to actually look at the intersection of both these things. So I've seen a lot of research predominantly talking about how COVID-19 has disrupted um, services with regards to PrEP, with regards to people following up with treatment and made kind of clinics and medical spaces think outside the box and do some different things. I think that research is, is ample. I, the research that I'd like to see would be more about maybe on the behavioral front, the social behavioral front, and the impact that this pandemic has had, uh, not only to our LGBTQ plus communities, but also um, intersecting with people living with HIV and the sense of isolation that a lot of people living with HIV feel on a daily basis. And then on top of that, having this COVID-19 pandemic, um, I'm sure we could make assumptions about how this is gonna impact mental health, but I think the intersection of kind of what we go through because it, all these kind of pandemics are happening like racism has made a resurgence um you know it's kind of like what did one of my colleagues i think it was uh dr manning kimberly manning had said she she made an analogy to acute on chronic heart failure it's like acute on chronic racism like it's already been there at a baseline and it just had like a resurgence and made the country sicker but we're seeing all these kind of social things interacting with the the, the physical and the viral and infectious uh, pandemics. And I think that kind of research is going to be ample um, as we're moving forward. And I think it's just as important as the research we need on say uh, an oral therapy for COVID-19 that Pfizer is coming out with or other vaccines or whether antibodies stay around after vaccines for six months, nine months or 12, or if we're gonna need you know serial vaccines. I think that kind of personal um, touch and the social behavioral research is going to be just as important uh, as the clinical trial research. Mm -hmm. And why I think it's interesting is because I hear this so much um, in my friend group is like, well, if they can find a vaccine for COVID-19, why don't we have a vaccine for HIV? And why can't we find cures for other things at the rapid pace that we found COVID-19? And I just tell people, 
listen, I'm not a clinician, but follow the science, um, find out what you know. And I think that's why, to me, that was such an interesting question that we have posed. Um, with that, but you did bring up an update that I actually saw today about the oral uh, medicine from Pfizer as well of using that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, because in that as well, too, they were, is it protease inhibitors? See, this is why I'm, I'm not a... <laughs> <laughs> I think Q would be the best. I only skimmed it over, so I don't know that much. I think this is a question that I know Q is going to be salivating over. Come on. <laughs> You're on mute. We want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Sorry. See, again, a year of a year into this. So it's so an oral antiviral. Um, I actually don't recall what class or what the mechanism of action is, but there has actually been a couple of them. Like the Pfizer just kind of came back up in the news, but it's interesting to, to know that there was one that we talked about earlier in the epidemic. So it looks like they're, they're different treatments, kind of along the lines of, you know, Tamiflu, where, you know, okay, you got diagnosed with flu, you got diagnosed with COVID, take this pill for three to four days. And it really isn't like, completely clearing it from your system. But this one is interesting. Um, I'm not gonna mispronounce the name because I, I, I can see it, but I'm not gonna try and pronounce it. But essentially what it does, it decreases the durations, the duration and severity of symptoms. So you can still have COVID, you still have the potential to pass it on to people, but you're not gonna get as sick, you're not gonna get up in the hospital, and you're, you're not gonna die. It's kind of like, you know, for me, those, are that, that's my end point. Those are the three things that we need to look for. And that's kind of what they look for with the vaccine and any oral therapy. How sick are you going to get? Are you going to end up in the hospital or, you, or are you going to die? And with this new oral therapy, you know, again, it's in super, super early trials. I don't even think they've tried. I don't even think it's in human trials yet. It's just like, hey, in the lab, this works. So you know, it's, it's an opportunity to, to look for other options. And again, adding to what we have. Got you. And one last question. I never feel like we have enough time, but Matthew Carroll, thank you again for another awesome question. Um, is there any benefit to the wait and see theory when it comes to vaccines? Is it okay to wait to the end of the line to get the vaccine? Just thinking about J&J &J vaccine pause that recently happened. Thank you for that, Matthew. I knew we were going to get to the J&J &J vaccine. So, <laughs> AstraZeneca as well, that conversation. There's so much to talk about. So who wants to take it? I'll, I'll jump in with a really short response that for anything, it's a personal decision. So wait and see is perfectly okay. So I'm not going to discount that. Um, what I will say about the J&J &J pause, I think most scientists have said it's evidence that science works. If you, if you if, again, I hate cliches, but it's it's the trust the process kind of thing. You know, it was rolled out. We saw that something happened. We stopped. We went back and looked at all of it in terms of like I think I just recently looked at an update. So we saw about eighty four cases of you know blood clots that occurred over seventeen million doses, and the most recent analysis pretty much said that there wasn't there was not a direct relationship between the vaccine and the development of clots. But I think that was an opportunity. It was like, hey, we saw this. There was some concern about it. Let's stop and go back and look at the data and really comb through it. And I think, you know, one of the things I said earlier on with um, the COVID epidemic is that this is one particular disease process where the media is in the lab. You know, the newsroom, <laughs> the news reporters, the journalists are in the lab. I think with anything that else, any of the other developments that we've had in medicine, nothing has gotten this much media coverage and scrutiny. So any little thing, like if someone you know, drops a pipette on the floor, it gets reported at this point. So I think, you know, take taking that with the word of, you know, with, the, with some caution. But I think, you know, with the J and J pause, it showed us that you know our process and science and looking at risk and looking at adverse effects, it works, and there really isn't a relationship. It added a little word of caution in terms of groups to use it in, but you know it doesn't mean that it's not safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the only the only thing I would add on to that is that 
unfortunately, that whole dynamic of, you know, we've never experienced a pandemic like this. Uh, America and the globe's like insatiable need for information right now, and that the media has to be on top of things and publishing shit even before it becomes official. Like that has that has also fueled into the distrust because I've heard those conversations where people are saying like, yeah, see, they rolled this out too quick. And then I'm looking at the numbers and you're looking at 17 million doses and 80 some odd cases. Come on. Like that's, it's not really in, in the big picture of things. You're looking at higher risk of developing clots and thrombosis. If you take a blood thinner, like they've talked about heparin and how kind of heparin can increase somebody's risk for this kind of, um, you know, uh, platelet problem that we're having with people having clots. And so it's one of those things where women on oral contraceptives, if you're smoking cigarettes, it could be a risk for this. So people will say a lot of stuff, but it taps into that whole notion where I'm not going to put that in my body. And it's like, well, oh, but you put this in your body and you put this in your body and you do this all the time. But mm -hmm. this is where you draw the line about what you put in your body. Like, it's just mm -hmm. kind of but again, I think it is something where I think Leo said this earlier that every it's about everyone as an individual. And I think every person has to do what they feel is right for them. I have no problem with people taking a wait and see approach to the vaccines, as long as you're doing the other public health measures. Because remember, this is not about just you. Like it's not just about you. And you could say, well, I got the vaccine or I got sick before, so I know I have the antibodies. So I'm not going to do the vaccine right now. But it's also one of those things where like, well, if you catch it, because you can catch it, even if you've had it before, even if you've had the vaccine, and maybe you'll have a milder form of the disease, but you could pass that on to somebody else. So it's really about unplugging human beings from the American matrix of narcissism and me, 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 and actually mm -hmm. thinking about a more community-minded approach to public health, which is what public health is about in the first place. It's not just about the one patient or the one person. It's about all of us. So what you do will have ripple effects on other people. And I think that's a, that's a hard thing to translate to people because to be honest, it's not that they don't understand it. I think a lot of people just don't want to hear it. I think a lot of people are just selfish, it. right? But yeah, they're yeah. just being selfish. So. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've seen this entire time, honestly, which is one of the reasons I was so excited that we are at this place where we have vaccines, because there are just a lot of people who all they think about, you know, is themselves. And um, yeah, I, I could go on and on about that. But <laughs> <laughs> did we hit a nerve, Dr. Leo? Did we hit a nerve? <laughs> I'm like, I'm out here working overtime and and many of us are out here working overtime and, you know, for people to have had these huge parties and events and things as if, you know, uh, none of the rest of us and the people that are getting sick and dying, you know, matter. Um, one of the things I was scrolling my Facebook um, earlier and one of my cousins wrote about the fact that she currently has COVID and COVID sucks and that for those people who aren't taking it seriously that they should. Um, you know, and I thought that that was just a very timely um, statement that she made, just given that I was going to be on this call uh, or on this, you know, present on this video and on our conversation is that, you know, COVID is still being spread. People are still getting COVID, even, you know, though we are at a point where we have this vaccine available, everyone's not vaccinated. It is still spreading. So we have to make sure that people are taking the appropriate public health measures, that you're wearing that mask, that you're keeping your distance that you're washing those hands, um, you know, all those things that are just so important. Yes, good way to end it. I swear it never feels like it's enough time when I um, sit here with you all. So any final finals before um, we get out of here? I would like to say some that Leo just said brought to me and it struck me um, while working at, at this HIV clinic, and I know both Leo and Quentin can co-sign on this, but it's like people are still getting HIV. People are still getting homeless. People are still coming down with neurosyphilis. People are still um, have, being fired from their jobs and having trouble uh, maintaining their daily lives. These things are still happening. So COVID-19, I. I don't know whether Miss Rona is going to be with us for the long term or how this is all going to play out. I don't think any of us really know. 
um, how this beast is going to fully play out over the years or decades to come. But I think it's something where we have to get used to it being present and a reality for at least the short term and get back to focusing on all the other things that are affecting our communities and our patients um, because those things aren't stopping. I'm seeing newly diagnosed HIV every time I'm in clinic or a recent diagnosed HIV um, person with living with HIV. So it's it's just one of those things where it's a reminder that yes, COVID is there and it's literally sucked up all the air in the room for the past year, but there's a lot of intersecting things that are going on and informing COVID-19 and being impacted by the pandemic. So we need to keep our eyes on all those things and, and you know, help, help ourselves and help our communities work through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I would say that we're seeing a lot of is congenital syphilis, a lot of babies being born with syphilis as well, you know, during this time. Um, just to piggyback on what, what David shared, I, I think, you know, for many folks, you if you do have a primary care provider, you've probably been, you know, haven't seen that provider. Um, so going and at least having a check up, I think is something, you know, that, that uh, if you're able to do that, that we should go ahead and do, you know, um, to just make sure that, you know, we're checking on, on our body. I will say that a lot of the people, and we know this from the data, a lot of people who died, they had either undiagnosed or are untreated hyper, you know, to me, it just was, a, um, you know, and so to me, now is the time for those uh, who are, you know, alive uh, to, you know, get to their provider, uh, get on treatment for any of and all of those chronic medical conditions and, you know, uh, try to improve eating and all those things that can um, lengthen our lives. And I'll piggyback on both David and Leo. I think, you know, definitely taking care of yourself and paying attention to your health. I think this has definitely opened everyone's eyes to that. It's like, you know, looking at when the vaccine rolled out in Georgia, one of the things that they mentioned was that if you're, your BMI, which is this kind of non-specific generic, you know, measurement of kind of whether you're overweight, you know, a BMI of 26, technically, you know, 27 to 28 means that you're overweight and you qualify for the vaccine because being overweight is a risk factor for COVID. And you look at the American population, I think we're probably the fattest country on the, the planet. And I think looking at that where you think that, oh, I'm not at risk, but actually you probably are. And then the other thing to piggyback on what David said, you know, this is, we don't have time for this. So this will go into a, a whole other conversation, but for the sixth consecutive year, the United States had hit an all-time record high for STIs. So even in the midst of a pandemic, people were still out, you know, having getting it, it in. in. <laughs> getting it in. And uh, that's what you wanted to say, Clinton. Getting it in. They were. Q, you they can say that. They're getting it in. Yeah. And so it's like, clearly, you know, there are so many other things going on, but, you know, as an infectious disease and sexual health doctor, I'm pretty sure all of us were like, wow, six years in a row, a record high in, you know, STDs. So, mm -hmm. we're number one. We're yeah, number I just one. I reminded the other day, so I will I will be on the, the STI check train because I've been getting it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, to people watching, to the brothers that are watching this Facebook Live, get your asses and your throat swabbed. I can't even tell you the number of asymptomatic gonorrhea and chlamydia that I've diagnosed since the pandemic and during the pandemic just by swabbing every orifice. So, and providers, if you're not doing it, make sure you're doing it. Yeah, had one last week. Yep. <laughs> Brought them in today. <laughs> Get them swabbed. So thank you so much to the Dream Team for joining me again here on Revolutionary Health. I want to thank you all. Thank you, Times 10, for all the incredible work that you all do. And for everyone watching, thank you so much for the incredible questions. We want to make sure these conversations continue, just not here and on YouTube, but in your communities. Get this messaging out. Send this video to people. If you have questions, send them in. And I will make sure I won't answer them because I'm not a clinician. But follow us on all our social media, CNP Tribe. To everybody out there, again, be good to yourself. See y'all later.